Hello, family, and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and we have a very special saint to share with you today, St. Vincent de Paul. Our cry rings out to the whole world. Take notice. We are in the times of great saints in the making. We are in the times of unequaled sinners. Enemies of God, we put you on notice. We've been there before. We've suffered the arrows of persecution in times past, and we are still here. We are not finished. In the past, for the last 2,000 years, just as it has appeared the end was near, the church was about to collapse, the world was coming to an end, God raised up super saints, those who said yes to God's call to holiness. One such great saint in the making, one soul who reached for and received the crown of glory in heaven was St. Vincent de Paul. The Lord said, I will raise the lowly to confound the proud. The church is in need. France, eldest daughter of the church, will give the world and the church a 17th century Mother Teresa. St. Vincent de Paul came from humble circumstances. He was born into a family of poor farmers. Coming from the poor, St. Vincent would always have a special place in his heart and his vocation for the poor, whether physically or spiritually. Holiness was evident in Vincent from infancy. His family said that from the earliest years, he would become elated when he was praying. As a child, he could be heard singing and praying the Psalms as he tended the cattle in the fields. The seed of faith had been planted by God and nurtured by his holy family. Do you have a future super saint in your family? St. Vincent showed a thirst and aptitude for learning which was further enhanced by a truly virtuous soul. Seeing this, his father scraped together what little he had to secure an education for this special son with the Franciscan friars. When Vincent had been in the school four years, he came to the attention of Mr. Comet, a nobleman of the village, who asked him to tutor his children. This overjoyed Vincent as what little he earned would enable him to cease being a financial burden on his parents. In 1596, at 20 years old, Vincent entered the University of Toulouse where he studied and prepared for the priesthood. In 1600, Vincent was to realize his dream. He was ordained a priest after having received the tonsure and minor orders of the Franciscan order. St. Vincent's walk was the living out of the gospel. Like Francis, his focus in life was to be more like Jesus. But initially, he saw Jesus studying the Word of God and the traditions of the church. The more he did, the more he became the gospel. Although he desired to continue his studies, the lack of funds and the debt he had incurred did not permit him to do so. But his holiness and generosity toward the poor came to the attention of a good woman, who upon her death bequeathed her estate to him. In 1605, Vincent left for Marseille to re retrieve the inheritance of 500 crowns which she had left him, as the estate consisted of a sum of silver owed to the departed by an unscrupulous debtor who had fled to Marseille rather than pay. In Marseille, he found the scoundrel only to have him offer far less than the debt owed, but having wisdom, St. Vincent accepted the paltry sum and repaired to return to Toulouse. A young gentleman staying in the same inn as Vincent suggested he book Bassage on the boat he was taking to Narbonne. As this fit his budget and would save him the time, Vincent joyfully accepted. The two newfound friends boarded the ship. The voyage began smoothly. The sun was shining. The Mediterranean Sea was calm. All was well aboard the ship. But suddenly, ominously, in the horizon loomed three ships carrying the colors of the Saracen Turks. They signaled the ship and pulled up to board her. The Turkish pirates commenced fighting immediately upon boarding the ship. Although the French sailors, along with Vincent joining in, fought bravely, they were way outnumbered and the ship was soon seized. Vincent's dream of returning home was now a horrible nightmare. The deck, brilliant, brilliantly lit earlier by the rays of the sun, was now covered with blood and lifeless bodies. The wounded Vincent and those not killed were taken prisoner and placed in chains for the rest of the voyage. At the end of eight days, after the pirates had satisfactorily benefited from other piracies, 
they set out for Tunisia. When they landed, in order not to be challenged by the French authorities, the pirates falsely claimed they had taken the slaves, Vincent was one of them, from a Spanish ship. They paraded them around the port, offering them for sale. The prospective buyers probed and inspected just as they would animals. After many humiliating and painful exhibitions required of the prisoners, Vincent was bought by a fisherman. As Vincent was not a good sea traveler, he soon became sick and useless to the fishermen, and so was sold to an elderly physician. Now the physician was kind and quickly learned to love Vincent. One problem was the good doctor was deeply interested in magic and tried endlessly to share the knowledge he had amassed his 50 years of research of alchemy. And the other, being a Muslim, he tried to convert Vincent to Islam. St. Vincent prayed tirelessly to Our Lady, begging for her intercession, and to whom he gave credit for his victory over this temptation. The old man died, and Vincent was now the chattel of his nephew, who had inherited Vincent as part of the legacy. The nephew was as cruel and heartless as his uncle had been kind and generous. But God is always listening and never gives us more than we can bear. Vincent was sold to an apostate Christian. His new owner sent Vincent to the desert to serve his three wives, one of whom was Turkish and a Muslim. But she was fascinated by Vincent's holy demeanor and would listen to his chanting of the Psalms, the Salve Regina, and other hymns as he went about his work. The woman would look into Vincent's tear-filled eyes, so obviously deeply in love with his God, that she began scolding her husband for having left his religion. Although not a Christian, she was to be an instrument which God would use to release the man from the bondage of his own apostasy. He and Vincent escaped to France in Marseille and finally Avignon. The fallen Christian made peace with the church, one year later went to Rome with Vincent and joined an order which served the sick in hospitals. The Vatican was awesome for Vincent. Here was the holy land upon which the center of his faith rested his church nourished by the blood of the martyrs. His eyes filled with tears and his voice choked with emotion as he filed past the tombs of the unbroken succession of popes who had served the church beginning with the first pope, St. Peter. He could have stayed and basked in the glory that was Rome, but he knew he had to go on to Paris. In Paris, he was able to get lodging in the area of Saint-Germain, but peace was to be short-lived for Vincent. A judge from Bordeaux, who also lived in the same house as Vincent, was robbed of a considerable sum of money. Although Vincent protested he was innocent, he was not believed, and was to bear the stigma of being a thief for six years. During the six long years, without friends and anyone who believed in him, he never endeavored to defend himself. He just bore the scandal, resignedly repeating over and over again, God knows the truth. Finally, six years after the fact, the truth always surfacing, a criminal arrested for another crime, wanting to clear his conscience, confessed to the crime that Vincent was accused of. St. Vincent never told anyone of his ordeal. Instead, he used this as a teaching on retreats he gave. Without using any names, he stressed the positive rather than the negative, remembering and teaching that we can sustain the pain of false accusations which pierce our hearts by truth, always remembering that God and his timetable will reveal the truth if it is his will. Thank God, even after six years in Vincent's case, it was God's will. Not all was said for pa in Paris for St. Vincent. There he met up with the holy priest, Father de Berul, who would later become a cardinal. Again, we see God's omnipotent chessman putting his chess pieces together, in position, lining them up to serve him and his church. Father de Barou asked St. Vincent to serve as a curé of a small parish outside of Paris. Then he commissioned him to be spiritual director to Countess Yogoy and serve as teacher to her children. St. Vincent was a champion of the sacraments, preaching often on most especially the sacrament of penance. 
One day, when the Countess was away on a trip, someone came to St. Vincent and asked him to go with him to hear the confession of a man who was dying. Before administering extreme unction, or the sacrament of the sick, it is now called, St. Vincent asked the man to make a general confession. It appears that when he asked the man certain questions to help him examine his conscience, St. Vincent discovered the man had previously made imperfect confessions because he had not properly examined his conscience, this rendering his former confessions sacrilegious. When Countess Joy Guy returned and her subject told her he might have died with sins on his soul had not St. Vincent properly prepared him, she begged St. Vincent to preach that Sunday in their country church on the feast of the conversion of St. Paul. After hearing his homily, the people flocked in such great numbers to have their confessions heard, St. Vincent had to ask the local Jesuits for help. St. Vincent's congregation have celebrated January the 15th as a solemn feast day from that day till today in commemoration of this momentous occurrence in their community's history. The time came when Father de Berul told Vincent it was time to leave the Countess home and go out to serve the common people who were in such dire need of spiritual nourishment. Gathering five other priests, Vincent formed a little community and they began converting many back to the true faith, calling many, including even royalty, to cease living scandalous lives painful to God. Although Countess Joygoy was in full accord with the great work that Vincent was doing, she made him promise he would never abandon the care of her soul and that he would be there to help her at the moment of her death. With that, the countess, always devoted to those whom God had entrusted to her, convinced her husband to establish a company of missionaries devoted to assisting and instructing the peasants. It's 1618. Enter St. Francis de Sales into Vincent de Paul's life. Now, St. Francis de Sales, Bishop of Geneva several years before, had founded the Order of Visitation, whose charism was to visit the poor sick. He had shared this dream with St. Fra Jane Francis de Chantel. But as it was not permitted at that time for sisters to come and go from their convents, he had to forsake his project. As the sisters were cloistered and could not leave the cloister, they had to be content opening boarding schools. Who to teach the young women? The Holy Bishop and St. Jane Francis de Chantal summoned St. Vincent de Paul and asked him to teach the daughters of the nobility who were boarders. Although eager to be with the poor, St. Vincent agreed out of obedience to the bishop and respect to their friendship. When St. Francis de Sale died, St. Vincent became St. Jane Francis' spiritual director. But his commitments to the Visitation Sisters and their foundress did not deter St. Vincent from serving the sick and the poor. God always forms holy clusters, putting people together he has chosen to do his will. We can see with all the diversions placed in our saint's path, he needed help. Besides, God never wanting any of us to think that it is us who are responsible for the conversion and healing that comes about chooses others in our lives to help us. And so it was with St. Vincent de Paul. Enter Margaret Nazo, who had been teaching the illiterate how to read and write. Hearing of St. Vincent, she set out to join him. Though she and her lady friends were of good intention, they lacked the necessary direction and leadership to do the work. And so a lady of the nobility, well-educated and talented, comes into St. Vincent's life. Louise de Marillac, whom God sent to him in 1625. Louise had been married a short time when her spouse died. Having heard of St. Vincent and his work with the poor and sick, she left Clichy where she was from and set out for Paris to meet him. She told St. Vincent her heart's desire was to serve the poor, that it was all she could think of. 